we're kind of we're here to continue part two of the Dark Shadows Dead Book Unbound interview. Um, you you do put a lot of really great words. I like reading the Dark Shadows Dead Book Unbound, and the first one that I read was really good too. When we talked about things that you didn't get that, what's some of the newer stuff that you added that is you, that you really enjoyed adding most? Sure, the big stuff occurred. Uh, after the book had really been composed and I was about to put it out on Kindle and I was very lucky because Mark Perry agreed to uh, write the introduction. And so I was very lucky in that he and I got to correspond for a while and that very much stimulated my, my thinking and my imagination. I, I'm, I don't work well alone. I, I'm someone who really needs a collaborator. I really need someone to be able to bounce ideas off of. And no, Mr. Perry was not a collaborator or something. You know, I, I was very lucky that he 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 was was interested in, in helping with the introduction and so on. But he was an important person I could bounce ideas off of. And so the first thing was <laughs> I, I had some new thoughts about uh, episode 364. And that was uh, that's the episode where Sarah visits Barnabas. And I had always thought it was important, but I remember watching it around December and I was blown away by how unbelievably important it was and how much it, it had to do with it. So kind of after having just read the book over and over again and, and thought about it, it, it had my imagination going. And so I got to write to him about that episode because I thought, okay, I, I'm always looking for a central thesis about what ties the series together. And that had some stuff that really tied it together. So that was number one. I wrote some new stuff about 364 and that's what I call the forward conclusion because it's ultimately what at the time was the point of the book. That was number one. Number two was after the the Kindle book came out, because the first draft of the Kindle book was almost like a beta test. And I have updated it again and again. So it's like if you bought that initial Kindle book, you're getting all the stuff that's in the new version. Yeah. Don't think you're getting, you know, cheated or anything. It's just that you have gotten a piece that has evolved every time your Kindle has synced or sunk or sank or whatever. Um, so I, this spring, I, especially we were talking about 1841, suddenly, uh, something occurred to me about 1841 parallel time and, and sort of what that meant for the series, because I, I do think that's important. And I try to tie that with the beginning of the series. That's something I did with the first book. And I, I went a little further, I think with it with it this time and it has to do with outsiders. And so I added, I added that piece, which to me really tied it together. And then the last thing that, well, there are two other things I added. I did add a who's who my friend Lowell said, we need a who's who we need to know who these people are, even though he's very familiar with the show. So I had fun doing that. But then the last thing is, and we might've talked about this in the last interview. It may be my favorite thing in the book, which is the afterword which is this script section. And I, I implore people, especially if you've gotten like, you know, if you've done the Amazon freebie version or whatever, uh, you know, you can read the book out of order. Yeah. You, you can just cherry pick your favorite storylines and, and, you know, you can read the book in any order you want. It's yours. Yeah. Uh, but whatever you do, please read the afterword. You read the afterword first. I don't care um, because I think it – when I – and I wrote that also when I was in correspondence with Mr. Perry. Uh, and we were talking about the TV show The Offer, which was about the making of The Godfather and about what a Dark Shadows version of that would be like. And so I wrote kind of a sample of what part of that would be. And it was the easiest writing I ever did – the easiest, I think, honestly, good writing I ever did. It just came to me who the villains were, who the heroes were, all the stuff in the making of, of Dark Shadows and how they evolved. Uh, and I surprised myself. But I think for a Dark Shadows fan, I hope for a Dark Shadows fan, it's something that has uh, a lot of meaning 
it's very sad, but not all of it is sad. I mean, you know, considering what how popular Dark Shadows was, the fact that it has kind of gone into the realm of trivia and it's gone into a realm where we have to have shows like this to talk about what matters in it uh, means that there's there's some analysis that has to be in there. And it means that there is a little bit of sadness because, you know, to talk about Dark Shadows always involves the, God, wouldn't it have been great if Hollywood had recognized the importance of these people and the strength of these people and had done more with them? Yeah. That's just part of the Dark Shadows discussion. To spend so many hours with these unbelievable talents and then to realize with so many of them, just because of the way show business is, that this would be it. This would be the main thing of their work that we would see. Yeah, there is a sadness to that, but there is there is beauty in sadness and there's commentary in sadness. And yeah, there are some sad things in there, but that sadness comes from love. And that sadness comes from, you know, gosh darn it, this is important. And there was, there were highs and lows, but, but, and, and also that not every showbiz story is a happy ending. Yeah. Uh, you know, we see these people not as themselves, but as characters. And so we imagine these, uh, you know, that they will lead the lives of characters. No, they're just leading lives. You know, a lot of actors have trouble paying the bills just a year or two after the show goes off the air, sometimes six months after, mm. you know, Walter Koenig didn't get a job for years after Star Trek went off the air and he had to become a writer. Mm. Uh, Jerry Lacey became a writer. I, I hate to use the term had to become, but for people who started out doing one thing, you know, maybe being a writer isn't what they initially intended. So uh, I'm, I'm really that to me is that that piece that afterward is I, I I got to explore and talk about things regarding Dark Shadows and the cast and the crew that I didn't know I felt. And I uh, and even after all this time and for all this writing, I had to surprise myself. And I think it's something that would be very moving to um to people. And I think it's just something they would enjoy. My my favorite things in the book, like in the Dark Shadows they've all come down so far, are still, and I know I've told you this before, but I really, really loved the Ben Cross Memorial. I loved the That's 19, so nice. Thank you. I loved the 1991 stuff that you put in afterwards, the after the Ben Cross Memorial, because I it 91 needed talked about. I had taught, you know, all of that stuff came from the Daybook column. Mm -hmm. And it just would be around Valentine's Day is when those episodes were out. And so, you know, I won't say having gotten bored with the series, but looking for new ways to talk about new things. I would see, because every day I would go on to the wiki. And in the morning in the East Coast, it's always a day behind. I don't know why. But I have to jump ahead a day and see what was going on. And if I saw there was a 1991 episode, for a couple of years, I would make a point of writing about that. Just for variety, just kind of shook it up. And I have a real relationship with that 1991 series because I had been a Dark Shadows fan for several years. And this suddenly felt like, like it was intended for me. This is, I was going to run home every night from college and watch this, you know, that it was, it was my contemporary Dark Shadows. And, uh, and so, yeah, I have a, I have a, I mean, I'm not saying it's better than the original or anything like that, but I, I was at the exact right age to have a specific relationship with it. I really like the John Carpenter font you use in the Hark in the cover. Yeah. What made you go with that? Exactly. Um, okay. When you're using fonts, one of the things you have two types of fonts, you have a serif, 
which has the little tails on the end, like Times New Roman. Mm -hmm. And then you have sans serif, which is very clean and elegant, like Helvetica. You know, and it doesn't have those little trills and frills. Uh, and one of the rules, because if you go on YouTube and because I, I, I am basically largely educated by YouTube. If you if you go onto YouTube and just type in how to use fonts, believe it or not, there are long instructional videos on fonts and font styles and typefaces. And one of the things that they say is mix them up. Not too many of them, you know, you don't want to have like eight or nine fonts going on on the same page or something, but it's, it's, it is permissible now to use either a sans serif as your major font and then a serif as your minor font. And so that sort of whiskey tango font that is the Dark Shadows Daybook logo, which is Wallace's invention, that Wallace found that and put that together, uh, has a very specific look. So you want something a little more classical to offset that. And that John Carpenter, that John Carpenter font just has that c kind of classic, solid Roman look to it. And it was one of several fonts I had. I was kind of scrolling through them and I realized, oh my God, that's the John Carpenter font or it's real close to it. And so it was fun to do non-obvious shout outs. Like, I'll tell you what an obvious shout out is. And it's so obvious that it's distracting. It's the use of the Star Trek font on um, uh, Devil's Rejects. Mm. You know, Devil's Rejects logo is the Star Trek font. Mm. And it's like, well, Rob, yeah, I know you like Star Trek. And I, I applaud, I like Star Trek. But all this does is make me think about Star Trek. I used a Star Trek font, but it was a much more obscure one. And it's the font that I use as the chapter headers. And that's the font. It's a very specific font from uh, the the Star Trek technical manual from the 70s. Right. And if you and if you know that, it's this very subtle shout out. There's a really good book. I think it's called Typography in the Future. And it's about fonts in major science fiction movies, like the fonts in Alien, the fonts in Blade Runner, the fonts in 2001 Space Odyssey. And you realize these things have been really deeply rooted in us, and we didn't even know it. And so it's it's fun to kind of reach those. How many initially? How many cover ideas do you did you have for the book? I went through uh, three major covers, and then actually four major covers and then uh, a bunch of variants on them. So, I mean, I could do a gallery of about 10 different covers. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, the best one is actually not the one I used, but it, it did heavily involve one of the likenesses of one of the actors. Mm -hmm. And even though I had kind of gotten an assurance it was okay, not, but it wasn't from the actor's family, but it was from his mm -hmm. own. I, and I, I, I totally trust them. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, I just thought, you know, yeah, but something weird could happen. And I really like that cane symbol. In the in the interview we did a few months ago, I think we started out talking about that that cane mm -hmm. symbol, the one behind me, and what mm -hmm. that means. Yeah, I really like the fact that you kept the original cover with the. <laughs> That's for you. You're responsible for that. <laughs> I was going to use a different cover, and you were so enthusiastic about this one that that's what i kept i just think it fits it's just it anytime i think about this book like the dark shadow the original dark shadows day book i think about the the red that the red cover and i think about the what's on the front yeah this catches my eye the dark shadows day book about with the the flaming the smoking cane it with the it's all red i like it it, it was meant it, thank you. It was meant to echo yeah. that first cover and and tell you that was very important to Wallace is that, you know, whatever the cover is to the second book, it needs to look like it is connected and comes from the same universe. Yeah. So it it accomplishes that also. It's the same, but it's very different, has a different color palette. Um, so, yeah. So, Patrick, I have a question for you. Dark Shadows Daybook number three? What? 
Uh, you know, it's it's weird because I have gone through the website, and I'll be darned. There are not only, I mean, like the first year of the column, not not great. I was figuring out what I was doing. It took me a while. And Wallace actually had to have a real come to Jesus meeting with me. Um, uh, I started the column in March of 2016. And by August of 2016, he said, Patrick, we got to have a talk. Because there were, I was, at the time, I was doing all of the episodes on a given day. And I was driving myself to exhaustion, just trying to cover all of this. And we had no idea really what the flavor and shape was. So he said, Patrick, just stick with one episode. And he also said, try this TV guide thing. So the TV guide thing was his idea. And, um, and so if you, if you, even if you eliminate those early things, and if you eliminate the stuff I've already used, I kind of went spelunking through the website innards the other day. And there's a lot of good stuff still there. Yeah. Two, I got to get off my duff and start writing them again. Yeah. Uh, because I take it a year hiatus so that any time I could spend on the column, I spent on the book. So that work went. Oh, come on. Really, Skype. Why is it? This thing is. Resume talk. 